Well, time goes pretty fast, so I thought I would uh, get started. All right. So I thought I'd start with our calendar, quick look at our schedule there. We've talked about everything but one section. And that one last section is section 10.7, is parametric equations. And then we will have covered everything that we plan to cover for this semester. Before we get into that, do you have any questions on 8.4, the polar coordinates and graphs that we covered last week, last Wednesday? Okay. I'm not seeing any. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, sir. All right, perfect. All right, that being the case, then I'll jump into parametric equations. Uh, let's see, where would we go from here? That means Wednesday, we can do a little review. We can answer any questions you've got on chapter eight for this one section from chapter 10. And then I'm thinking next Monday, we could have another session here where we review, and then we wouldn't need to meet on Wednesday. I'll just have the exam run the latter half of next week over chapter eight in this one section from chapter 10. Is the exam gonna be in uh, my math lab or is that gonna be Blackboard? It'll be in my math lab. Okay. And then there will be an assignment in Blackboard where you can upload your scratch paper so I can give partial credit. Wait. Kind of a challenge for me. I've been going through an exam for in another class trying to coordinate the partial credit. And if a student doesn't clearly label their scratch paper, it gets to be quite a challenge to figure out which problem they were looking at. But, and you will all label it well, and so it'll be easy. You want us to just put easier numbers. for me. Just yeah, put number, yeah, like just a, a row problem row number. Paper. Okay. And yep, write down the problem. Uh, if you don't want to work that problem, go ahead and skip it. Maybe give yourself some extra space on that sheet. But definitely label which problem you're looking at. Is there a time limit? Like, what's the time limit we're looking at? There will be a time limit. Let's see. Orig normally, we get 50 minutes, and I've been giving an extra 15 minutes for each exam. So you'll have 65 minutes to take the exam. Okay. All right. Let me jump back and share Photoshop again. It seems to work pretty well for us. Generally, well, it starts jumping around on the screen like that. All right. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. Parametric equations are two equations in x and y that have another variable within them. And often what we use in here is t. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Say, oh, I grab the right tool for sure. x equals 1 half t. And y equals t squared minus 3. So we can see we've got equations in x and y, but they've got this other variable in them, t. And I think the reason they often use t in here is because in the real world, we have lots of parametric equations where time is the variable. Something like if I were to throw a ball, it would travel horizontally 
a certain distance for every second, and it would travel vertically a certain distance every second. So T and is representative of time. So T would represent time in that example. But T can and be essentially any factor depending on the situation. It could, yep. But I think they tend to use T in these because most of our real world examples are time related. And what they do with these is they give us a, a limitation on T. Say negative three is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to positive three. So now we have a set region that we actually need to look at. So what we'll do to plot these is we'll set up a TXY table. Well, that's not very vertical, but my T is limited. Negative, between negative three and positive three. And so that will change my values of X and Y. And all I need to do is plug these T values in for X and Y. So X when T is negative three, would be negative three halves. When T is negative two, we get negative one. When T is negative one, we get negative one half. And all I'm doing is plugging this T value in for T here in X. When t is 0, x is 0. When t is 1, x is 1 half. When t is 2, x is 1. And when t is 3, x is 3 halves. So now we've got the x values. Now I'll plug t in here and get the y values. So negative 3 quantity squared is 9, minus 3 is 6. Negative 2 quantity squared is 4, minus 3 is 1. Negative 1 squared is 1, minus 3 is negative 2. 0 squared is 0, minus 3 is negative 3. 1 squared is 1, minus 3 is negative 2. 2 squared is 4, minus 3 is 1. And 3 squared is 9, minus 3 is 6. So now we have x, y values, and those are really the values that I prefer to graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of cross through this column because I don't want to accidentally use that while I'm graphing. Let me turn on this coordinate system here. I'm going to plot those x, y points. So we've got negative 3 halves, which is negative 1 and a half, and that was as high as 6. So I've got a point here. And then when x was negative 1, y was 1. That's there. When x was negative a half, y is negative 2, down here. When x was 0, y is negative 3. When x was a half, y was negative 2. When x was 1, y was 1. And when x was 3 halves, y is 6. So now I've got those points. So I can just kind of connect those. Let's see if I can do this. And notice I'm not going to continue the arrows up because we had these limitations on t. And those limitations mean this graph doesn't extend any further than that particular portion right there. Ben, you've got a question? Uh, where do you get the y values from? I got the y values. The, the problem that was given to me was that equation for x, that equation for y, and these limitations. And so I took these limitations on T. Oh, 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 I see, I see. Because I was looking at the, because I was looking at the, I was looking at it as, a, I thought, I thought for, I was acting like it said X equals T squared minus three, but it was Y. I'm sorry, that was just. Okay, good. No worries. Better to ask than just to wonder for the rest of forever. 
All right. So now we've graphed this set of parametric equations. And it was simply a matter of creating a TXY table, plugging in the limitations on T into both X and Y, and then plotting X and Y on our graph. Doesn't seem too bad. Let's try another one, only this time they will also ask us to find the rectangular equation. Okay, so the problem they've given me is x equals t squared. y equals t minus 1, I'm counting, and negative 1 is less than or equal to t, is less than or equal to 4. And we are asked to graph these and then find the uh, equivalent rectangular equation. So a rectangular equation only has x and y in it. So we're good there. So let's graph this. We'll find our txy table. So t is between negative 1 and 4. I'll plug those values in for t in x. So I'll basically square each of these. Negative 1 squared is 1. 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. And 4 squared is 16. Just plugging those t values into the x equation. Now let's plug them into the y equation. So we're subtracting 1 from each t value. So this will be negative 2 negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So now we have our x, y values. Again, I'm going to cross out this table because invariably, when I go back to it, I always try to plot the t, but my Cartesian coordinate system doesn't have t. It's only x and y. So... I'm throwing myself off by having that table, but when I cross them out, I do a much better job. So let's go ahead and plot these points where x is 1, y is negative 2. Where x is 0, y is negative 1. Where x is 1, y is 0. x is 4, y is 1. Where x is 9, y is 2. And I don't have enough x values to keep going. So this would extend to the right until x equals 16. I just need a better Cartesian coordinate system. And then I'll go ahead and finish that graph. And it would, as I say, continue going to the right until x is 16 and y is 3. So that would be the graph of this particular curve. It would be smoother than the way I wrote it, but... You know how I draw. Okay, now we need the rectangular equation of this particular curve. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to solve for t in one of our equations and plug that into the other one. So if I take this y equals t minus 1, I'm counting, I'll go ahead and add 1 to both sides. I get y plus 1 equals t. Now that I have that, I can plug that into t in the other equation. So I'm going to take that portion and just plug it in here. So now I have x equals y plus 1 quantity squared. And when I square that, I get x equals 
y squared plus 2y plus 1, which is the equation of this particular shape. It is a parabola. It's opening to the right, and so we would expect y to be squared instead of x and so on. But we also have some limitations on here. Notice our x values only went from 1 to 16. So we could say, actually they went from 0 to 16. So we could say 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 16. We have that limitation on the x value. We also have a limitation on the y values, such that negative 2 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 3. Those limitations exist on this particular graph and they we have to put those in there to really highlight that we aren't showing the whole graph of x equals y squared plus 2y plus 1. We are limiting both the x and y values and by doing that we end up with the graph to the right in blue. It, is there always going to be a limit? In these qu equations there will, yep. Okay. And in the book, they only put the limitations on y because that is the independent variable, the variable on the right-hand side. So they they wrote both of these, but this was the only one they actually included in the answer because that would set what the x values are. All right, so that's... Uh, Kind of the gist of parametric equations is we're given given some equations and then we need to potentially get a corresponding rectangular equation with limitations we may need to graph it and so on but that's kind of the bulk of what we're talking about let's take a look at another one Looks a little worse. Say we've got x equals 5 cosine t. So now t is not time, it's an angle. y equals 3 sine t. And 0 is less than or equal to t, it's less than 2 pi. So the angle only goes once around, and they actually have less than or equal here too. So we could find some variables. Let's, let's go ahead and do a, a t, x, y. It'll be a little different this time because t is an angle. So we may do zero, let's see, we'll want pi halves, maybe pi fourths, pi halves, let's do three pi over four. Let's see. Oh, I may be putting too many in here that we don't want to work. Let's just try a zero pi halves pi three pi halves and two pi that's each of the axes so at zero cosine which are the x values that would be a one times five is five the cosine of pi halves is zero times five is zero. Cosine of pi is negative one times five is negative five. Cosine of three pi halves is zero times five is zero. And this would be the same as zero, an angle of zero. So now we'll look at sine values. The sine of zero is zero times three is zero. Sine of pi halves is 1 times 3 is 3. Sine of pi is 0 times 3 is 0. 
sine of 3 pi halves is negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. And sine of 2 pi, this would be the same as the sine of 0. So now plotting these, we've got 5, 0, which is here. We've got 0, 3. We've got negative 5, 0. We've got 0, negative 3. And we've got 5. And there would be values completing those. It's essentially, oh. I did a great job of finding that dot and that one. So I wanted a wider ellipse than I, they actually wanted, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, it is an ellipse. And if you'll recall from our work in uh, algebra, previous semesters, an ellipse has a very particular type of equation. So if I were to say, Take my equation, x equals 5 cosine t. And I solve it for cosine t. And then I take my y equation. And solve for sine. Well, I happen to have a particular equation that I am a little fond of. And you, I'm sure, recognize that. That's our first Pythagorean identity. Well, I have a value or something I can plug in for sine and something else I can plug in for cosine. So this is an awful lot like x over 5 quantity squared plus y over 3 quantity squared equals 1. So x squared over 25 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. And that we would recognize as an ellipse. We've got both x squared and y squared. They're over different values. And if you'll recall from algebra, well, we would have had x minus h quantity squared. So there was nothing subtracted from x. That means the horizontal value for the center is zero. Nothing is subtracted from the y. So the vertical value of the center is zero. So the center of the ellipse is zero, zero, which we see in our graph. The value under the x squared is the major axis distance squared. And the major axis, well, half of it, is that. So there's our 5. You square that and put it under the x because it's a horizontal ellipse. We have our minor axis, which is 3. Square that and put it under the y, again, because it's a horizontal ellipse. So this really fits what we learned in algebra quite well. We used an identity to get there, but we used parametric equations to graph this and then got a, an equivalent rectangular equation, which I suspect most of us are a little more comfortable with than the parametric equation, though sometimes we need to look how things change over time. And so we would use this sort of analysis to do that. Any questions about that or anything else we've talked about? All right. <laughs> Sorry. I I don't really have a question about any of this. I'm, I'm kind of referring back to the test really quick for our scratch paper. How long did you, are you going to give us to turn that in? Because I know like I've had to do previous tests in different classes where it took me a while to scan it just because my computer's slow. Um, well, let's see. I'll have the exam probably run from 
say Wednesday to Saturday, and I would want the scratch paper in by the next Monday night. Okay. Probably. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that way it gave me a little bit of time to hopefully get it figured out. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Now, well, let's take a look at an example where time is a factor. And, and I want to share with you a couple of equations. This is, these are equations of motion. So those of you who have taken physics have seen these equations or versions thereof. X equals B naught cosine theta times T. y equals h plus b naught sine t, I'm sorry, sine of theta times t minus 16 t squared, where t is time. t is very clearly time here, and so it's not going to be anything other than that. So let's take a look at the setup that we're talking about here. Got ground, we'll start on some structure, we will launch something, and it will follow a parabolic curve. So H is the initial height, the height at which this thing is launched. It is launched with a very particular velocity. B naught is initial velocity. That angle there is theta. So cosine theta would give me the horizontal component of the velocity. And that horizontal component is what dictates how far horizontally this thing moves. The sine of theta would give me the vertical component of the velocity. And that tells me how much this thing is going to fight gravity until it hits the peak. And then its gravity is going to pick it up from there and drop it down. And that's where this 16 comes in. That's all due to gravity. Now, that 16 only works in our US customary system because gravity pulls on all of us at about 32.2 feet per second squared. And so half of the 32 is the 16. That's where that 16 comes from. So these two equations, and I, I believe you've got a homework problem that wants you to use these equations, and that's why I'm taking the time to show this to you. I want you to see those now. They are in the book. They are on page 775, but I wanted you to see it now so that you could see what we were talking about. So let's take a look at a problem. It says a baseball is thrown from a height of six feet with an initial speed, so that's B naught, of 100 feet per second. and an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal. And we are asked to find a number of things. The parametric equations that give the position of the ball at any time t. They want us to graph it, find the height of the ball after one second, two seconds, three seconds. Determine how long the ball is in the air, the horizontal distance, maximum height, all of those things. So our parametric equations, we just plug in what we know. E naught is 100. And we've got cosine of 45 degrees times T. We know the cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2. 
So we could rewrite this as 100 times root 2 over 2 t, which is just 50 root 2 t. So there's the x value. We can get the horizontal distance at any time t. We just plug t in there, and it will give us that horizontal distance. We'll do the same sort of thing with y. You got h, which was 6, plus v naught, which was 100, sine of 45 degrees, times t minus 16t squared. So plugging in all of those, and I'm going to rearrange it a little bit, negative 16t squared, because I do like the largest exponent first, plus 50 root t, root 2 t, because we know the sine of 45 is root 2 over 2 times 100, it would give us that same value, plus 6. So now we have two parametric equations, x equals 50 root 2 t, and y equals negative 16 t squared plus 50 root 2 t plus 6. So those are the two parametric equations that govern what's going on with this baseball. Are there going to be times it won't give us t, but it'll, it'll be just like this, or versus times that it will actually give us all the factors? Um, or are we just going to be expected to kind of just fill in the blank like we just did to, to get the actual parametric equation? Or we'll be asked to find parametric equations like we just did. Sometimes they will ask us to find x or y at given t values, in which case we would just plug t in. Plug t in, right, okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, right now, the next thing was to find the height of the ball. So the height would be the y component, right? You need y at 1, 2, and 3 seconds. So we need y of 1, y of 2, and y of 3. Those were part of the problem. So we just plug those in. And go to my calculator. Got a negative 16. I know times 1 squared in my head. That one's not too bad. Plus 50 root 2. Plus 6. And I get 60.7 feet after one second. Assuming my calculator did a good job. A y of 2, we would do the same thing, but we're going to plug in 2 for t. I hope you're doing the same things. Uh, negative 16 times 4 would be a negative 64. I'm going to do plus 100 root 2. 2 times 50 is the 100, plus 6. And I get 83.4. So after two seconds, this thing is higher than it was after one second. And these would be feet. Three seconds, it may be already on its way back down. We'll see what it is. I'm not sure just when it, this one reaches its peak. We could use our um, vertex formula from algebra to figure that out. It shouldn't be too hard. But uh, I'm not going to do that right now. Yeah, I get 74.1 feet here. So this is already on its way back down after the third second. So it's already peaked and it's working its way back down towards the ground. We expect that from a baseball that we throw. So 
So that's not new information. The question next is determine how long the ball is in the air. What do you think we ought to do for that? How in the world could we figure out how long this is in the air? Basically, we want to know how long until it reaches this spot, right? The ground? What's the y value right there? Zero. Zero. So, if y equals zero right there, well, I can just plug that into my formula. Zero equals negative 16 t squared plus 50 root 2 t plus 6 quadratic. Looks um, like I didn't bring my fancier calculator to go ahead and calculate that for me. I've got one that'll I just plug in the A, B, and C, and it gives me the, the values of T or X, depending on what I'm using. And I'd personally rather do that than... We can do the quadratic formula, of course. So here's my A, there's the B, there's the C. And so T would be the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 times A times C. And this is where signs really matter. The A is a negative all over two times A. And I'm gonna cheat for a minute and go to the book. T is negative 0.1 or 4.5. Well, as it turns out, my time machine isn't working yet. So the negative time doesn't make sense, but the positive time does. So it takes 4.5 seconds for this baseball to hit the ground. Four and a half seconds. Doesn't sound like much until you think about how long that thing is in the air. I mean, we play catch, right? How long is, when you throw a ball to somebody, how long is it actually in the air? And that 4.5 might be a decent amount of time. Of course, we launched this thing at 100 feet per second, so maybe, maybe this thing fits all really well. Let's see, we were asked the horizontal distance that the ball travels. Horizontal distance is the x. So x is this full distance at this time. So now I can go to my x equation. x equals 50 root, t, root 2 times t, and we had 4.5 seconds. So 50 root 2 times 4.5. I get 318.2. That's how far this ball traveled, 318 feet. So that how is about get, the length. I'm sorry. How did you get the 4.5 for the T? Uh, uh, from this. Mind. Never mind. Got it. Got it. I, quadratic equation. Some reason I, I missed the bottom portion of that quadratic. Okay. Got it. Okay. So they threw this the length of a football field plus six yards. So it went from one field 
field goal line over two, about 60% through the end zone on their side. So they threw it pretty far. They can, might not have been just a guy throwing it. Yeah. And the last bit was to find the maximum height of the ball. So I think we probably do want to use our vertex formula. You don't recall, just in case, let me rewrite that because we haven't been in algebra in a minute or two. The vertex formula is negative b over 2a is the x component. And then the y component is the function evaluated at negative b over 2a. That's the vertex of the parabola. And everything that we throw in this world travels like a parabola, assuming that we don't have a lot of side winds and so on. So if we use this vertex formula with our quadratic here, then this would be the t and this would be the y. So the time, and this is the time at the vertex right here. There's our vertex. So the time to reach that vertex is negative b over 2a. And I'm taking this time to go through this because I think you have a problem like this on the homework and I wanted to be sure you saw this. So negative 50 root two, which was our B value, over two times A, which was negative 16. 50 root two divided by 32. is 2.21, so that's how many seconds it took to get to the vertex. And that's why the three is actually lower. The, the y value at three seconds is lower than the y value at two seconds because it's well past the vertex. So now the height will be the function evaluated at that time. Uh, ben, you've got your hand up before I go. Uh, yes, in the homework and quizzes and stuff, are we going to have uh, c questions that are this com complicated? You may. I don't remember for sure, but I think you do have one that uses these X and Y equations of motion. Oh. So we, we do have this. I am recording this session. So you can refer back to this if you need to. But I'm pretty sure you've got one that uses this V naught cosine theta t for x and h plus V naught sine t sine theta t minus 16 t squared. I think you will need to use those in the homework. So our y value evaluated at 2.21 we're just plugging this in for t into our y parametric equation. And when we plug that in, we get a y value of 84.1 feet. So that's how high this baseball actually went into the air all based on these parametric equations. And like I said, these show up in physics and engineering and lots of places where we look at projectile motion. We're using parametric equations there. And so this is a direct example of the time we would use those. And that is everything that's covered in section 10.7 on parametric equations.
you have any questions on anything we've talked about today? Okay, if we don't have questions, we can call it a day. Uh, definitely take a look at this video again if you're still struggling with what we talked about. Uh, check the chapter. It does a good job of explaining how we get the various par uh, points to plot. Like if I go back here and we look at how we got this first set of points. We created our TXY table and so on. Then we did something similar with this one, noting the limitations on our graph. This one, we went ahead and got our points, plotted it, and it was, oh, that's an ellipse, and we know what that equation was. So we can plug those in. And then we had this big beast. Uh, on, this, on this one, will you put the square next to the 2.21? So if I'm looking at it later, I don't confuse myself on the bottom right. Oh, yep. Thank you. Thank you. And I should have, that shouldn't be T, that should be 2.21 there too. I'm glad you asked and mentioned that. Oh, that was terrible. Let's see if I can fix this. That looks pretty bad right now. Thank you. That looks much better than the way I had it before. <laughs> that would have been confusing. Any other comments or questions? All right, then let's call it a day. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care of yourselves and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. If you've got questions on any of the homework, we can go over those. Wednesday will be kind of a review day of Chapter 8 and this one section of Chapter 10. And that's our last lecture for the semester. It's kind of a, kind of a relief to get done with that, but now we've got some time to kind of relax and go over that information, make sure we're ready for this last test and then the final, and then we'll be good to go. So have a good day and I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.